Welcome to the Radiant Visalia podcast. Join us at one of our two services, 9 a.m. and 1045 a.m. Download the Church Center app or visit our website, radiantvisalia.com, to stay connected with us. All right, enjoy. That he is risen. He is risen. He is risen. Where is he? It's funny that we can't answer that question with the same confidence. And it's for a couple reasons. The first is that I didn't ask the question three times. If I would have asked the question, where is he, three times, by the third you, the first one you would have been like, he, he, heaven? And the second one I would have been like, where is he? And you would have been like, heaven? And then by the third one you would have been like, heaven. I think that he's there. And the second reason it's hard for us to answer that question with confidence is because we hear a lot about Jesus' resurrection and its implications, but we don't hear a lot about his ascension. And the implications of his ascension. So I want to um, start there. Because I'm noticing that... Um, well, I just, I just want to start there. Is that okay? Do I have to explain it or can I just go? Okay. I was like going to qualify and then I thought, no one cares. No one, no one cares. They don't... I've got the mic. Don't count the pages as I look through them. You'll get discouraged. <laughs> it got rowdy in the first service, and so this I started throwing notes. All right, lock and load. Here we go. The Easter story, all about the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, right? But what, what, what happened after his resurrection? Like, if he's alive, where is he? Like, if he's alive, what's he doing? If he's alive, does he know about what's going on in Belgium? If he's alive, does he know about what's going on, our, on in our polls? And can he, can he do something about that? Where is he? And... Um, the Gospels record that after Jesus rose from the grave, he appeared in his resurrected body to many people over a period of 40 days. So for 40 days, he appeared to many people. And then after 40 days, it says that he ascended into heaven. So the answer to the question, where is Jesus, is that he's in heaven. He's seated at the right hand of the Father. He is exalted and he is seated. And I found this interesting as I reflected upon it this week, you know, because heaven is reserved for the deceased, not for those who are alive. What a bummer that must have been for the first disciples, you know, his first witnesses to say, they're running through the street saying, he's risen, he's risen. And people are like, that's amazing, he's alive, we saw that he was crucified. Where is he? Well, you just missed him. He just went to heaven. Well, I'll tell you what, uh, I also have a grandma who died and rose to heaven. It's like, well, he rose, and he rose, and he kept rising, and he kept rising, and now he's in heaven. And before you think like, well, that's convenient, the first disciples then didn't have to show proof of his resurrection because they pulled the trump card. Oh, well, he's in heaven. Well, you can't see him. You know, it's like that high school friend that you had who was like, yeah, I've got a girlfriend. She's real hot, and she lives out of town. She lives out of town. Well, when are we going to get to meet her? When are we going to get to meet this girlfriend of yours? It's like, well, she, you know, it's real, she's real busy, like with the modeling and everything. And <laughs> she's probably not likely to meet her, you know. Uh, before you think that the disciples are like that friend from high school, know that these men died defending this event. 
That they saw the risen Lord with their own eyes and touched Him with their own hands. And they died for an event. A lot of people die for their beliefs. Suicide bombers die for their beliefs. Many men die for their beliefs. These men were asked to deny an event and they would not deny the event. So before you think they're like that high school friend of yours, please remember that they hung upside down and were tortured for what they saw. And they wouldn't back down from it. So, through faithful witness and through scripture, we know that Jesus is in heaven. What is he doing? Let me read from Hebrews chapter 1. Long ago, and at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, He's spoken to us by His Son, whom He appointed the heir of all things. What's He doing? What's He up to? Through whom He also created the world. He's the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of His nature, and He upholds the universe by the word of His power. After making purification... For sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. For to which of the angels did God say, and this is a quote of Psalm 110, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. King David prophesied hundreds of years before Jesus that he would ascend and that he would sit and that he would sit and wait until his enemies were made a footstool under his feet. So he's in heaven. And then what did Jesus do when he got to heaven? I love this. He sat down. He sat down because it's done. He sat down. Sat down. His task is complete, and he decided to give us a visual of just how done he was, just how complete his work was. When he got to heaven, he sat down because he's done. He's done. Is there anything better than sitting down when you're done? I had the kids most of this week, and I didn't have Tiff, and it was a good feeling when the kids were down and the house was cleaned up, that didn't happen. <laughs> and their teeth were brushed, which also didn't happen. But anyway, the kids were down. And then I sat down and it's done. And it's a good feeling to sit down. I love the after party. You know, you have like a party and then a few close friends, the people who you really like, Stay longer. And they help you clean up. Because they're your real friends. And then the party's over. And what do you do? You sit down together. And the kids are down and the wine comes out and the feet go up and the party was a success. And it's done. There's nothing left to do and it's a great feeling. We have a seated Savior. Christianity, not necessarily about what you do and don't do. It's about what he has done, what he has accomplished. We have a seated Savior that we will forever marvel at. How done? Well, the writer of Hebrews goes on. In chapter 8, he just says it again. He says, now the point in what we are saying is this. We have such a high priest. We have such a high priest. I mean, we're talking about a high priest. We have such a high priest. One who's seated at the right hand of the throne of majesty in heaven. He goes on in chapter 10 of Hebrews. And every other priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. Now he's writing to a group of people who understood the temple and understood what went on in there. And so he's saying to them, you know your priests, right? Well, your priests, well, they're always busy. They're constantly doing and going, right? You know the temple, there's a ton of furniture in there, all of it's gold, most of it can't be touched. Well, there's no chairs in there because your priests don't sit down. Well, let me tell you about this high priest that we have in Jesus. 
But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, He sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until His enemies should be made a footstool for His feet. For by a single offering, He has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. You've got busy priests who keep going and keep going and keep striving and keep trying. We have a great high priest who offered one sacrifice for sin and then he sat down. Mic drop. It's over. It's over. It's finished. It's done. This is really good news. Want to know why? Nothing's ever done. (laughs) Nothing's ever finished. Nothing's ever finished, right? I mean, is there any better words? I mean, in Jesus' own words on the cross, what did He say? It's finished. It's finished. I long to say those words. (laughs) My job is daily to grow my to-do list. I come into work. I don't do anything but grow my to-do list. And then I come home and Tiff goes, what you, how was your day? I go, oh, my day was all right. Why was it just all right? I didn't get as much done as I needed to get done. It's not finished. I didn't finish anything. Well, didn't you have that meeting? Yeah, and at that meeting, my to-do list grew. That's what happened in that meeting. I got more things to do. More in my inbox. I don't like emails. Just, if you've sent me an email and then you waited for months, I just, I'm sorry. I'm not justifying my sin. I'm just saying I don't like emails. More in my inbox. And then reports, maybe for you, they just keep dropping. And then and you start to feel overwhelmed because nothing is done. And then Jesus appears with the good news. Not good advice, like you should do this in order to schedule your day. The good news is finished. It's done. What? It's just music to my ears. Things are over. over. The Christian life is about being profoundly aware of a Savior who is seated. Profoundly aware of a Savior who is seated. God's not after your sacrifice. He's after you forever marveling at his sacrifice. He's not after what you can do. He wants you to forever marvel at what he has done. It's finished. He was beaten. Somehow, this is good news for us, you don't have to beat yourself up anymore. He was beaten. This is good news. He was beaten. You don't have to beat others up. You don't have to atone for what you've done wrong. You don't have to make up for it. It's finished through one sacrifice He completed it. It's over. It's so over that he sat down and he's just waiting to put his feet up. I'm hoping today that you would be saved from such a small and pathetic view of who Jesus is and what he's done. That you would stop making more of what you've done than what he's done. Our salvation, our satisfaction... Our eternal life, forever achieved by the efforts of another. This is hard to believe. It really is, for a lot of reasons, and we'll go into that. Jesus lived a life, the life we should have lived, died the death we deserved. Now everything he has is ours. What is up with this? This is hard to believe. You know, it's not just unbelievers who struggle to believe in the gospel of done. It's believers who struggle to believe in the gospel, that it is finished, that he is seated. It's not just hard to, well, I can't put my faith in that. Some people struggle to put their faith in it is finished. But we all struggle to keep our faith in it is finished. And my hope this morning is to present to you a risen, exalted Savior We struggle to believe in the gospel of done because everything is undone. 
I mean, I, I look around and it just feels like chaos, right? Am I right? And I, I'm not saying I look around like out in the world because the world's going down. I look around in my own church and it feels like chaos. I went up to the mountains with Mark and Jared, who are the elders, the senior leaders here, pastors here, and we had 24 hours together. And I needed 24 hours away because I needed to make some decisions, and I needed to handle some things, and I needed to figure some stuff out, and I needed to deal with some stuff. So let's get up to the mountains. Let's seek God. I took nine books with me. It's 24 hours. I don't know. I mean, I did I just thought, I don't know which one I'm going to need. One of them has to have some answers for what I'm dealing with here. I don't know if one of them, I hope that one of them was the Bible, but I'm not sure. We go up there, and we've got 24 hours, and we just start right in. Well, what about this? Well, and then there's this. Did you hear about that? And, you know, the meeting is just sinking, you know. Just like, oh, yeah, I forgot about that. Oh, man, we suck at that. Oh, you know, we should have done this. You know what? Easter's coming. Yeah, Easter's coming. I forgot about that. Then what are we going to do this summer? I don't know. What about the fall? We were going to put in place a missions board, 24 hours. <laughs> Discuss what membership looks like at Radiance. We were going to talk about some of the changes that are happening in our staff. We were going to solve all the problems of the world. And we ended up really discouraged really focused on ourselves, very aware of our shortcomings. And we woke up one morning, and I started reading from a book by David Murray on the doneness of what Jesus has done. And it just interrupted my to-do list. And all of a sudden, I was seeing my to-do list in a whole different way. Sure, we're going to do things, but we're going to do things from this place of understanding what Christ has done. And we just started thanking God for what He's done and just marveling at what Christ has done. We started announcing with our mouths, it's finished. It's finished. He's done it. He's carried the load. He's carried the weight. We're free from this burden. We're crying. We're repenting. Jared's shaking on the floor. I've got my hands in the air. We're just like, this is amazing. Jesus, the author, the perfecter, the finisher of our faith, showed up and saved us from ourselves. It was amazing. And so we had a little bit of time left, and the temptation was, well, let's now talk about what we need to do. So Mark chimed in, well, you know, we got this situation. We were like, shush! You're going to screw this up, man. You're going to mess this up right now. Quit talking about what we need to do. Let's just keep looking at Jesus. Shush, Jared! Stop talking that way. It's so hard to keep our faith in the finished work. So hard to keep our faith in the gospel of done. Listen, your duties have been performed perfectly. Your duties have been performed perfectly by another. This can't be true, right? It's not what this is about. You come to church, you get some do's and don'ts. You don't get done's. Nothing's done. You get not done when you come to church. You get do it better when you come to church. Pastor never says done. Done. I didn't say it. And I'm certainly not seated. He said it. I think he means it. The reason we struggle to believe the gospel of done is that we don't yet see everything under his feet. We don't yet see everything under his feet. We look to the right and to the left. We look at what's going on around us and it just feels like everything's undone. Right? Can I get an amen? amen. The writer of Hebrews knew that they'd probably struggle with this. So in chapter 1, when he says, he's hi, he's seated, he's over these things, he knew that the church was probably going, really? Because it kind of feels like we're losing. It kind of feels like we're shrinking. It kind of feels like we're on the run. And then in Hebrews 2, he clarifies. Now, in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside of his control. That's a crazy statement. God left nothing out of his control. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him. 
At present, we just don't see it. We have something positionally that we just can't see it playing out around us. Paul in the book of Romans says it this way, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it. It's part of the plan that this plan down here doesn't play out. Does that make sense? It's part of the plan that this unravels. In hope that the creation itself would be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we are saved. And now hope that is seen is not hope for who hopes and what he sees. But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. It's hard to believe because we don't yet see it. Yet we're contending that this is reality. And we invite that kingdom to rule and reign, not just in our lives, but in our communities. Bring it. Bring that reality to bear on what's happening around us. We know it's true. We want to see it. We also struggle to believe the gospel of done because you have an accusing conscience. Is that true for you? Like an inner taskmaster. Like a a driver inside saying, do, do, do. And we hope to hear done, but we don't hear done inside. We hear not done, not done. And we hear do better, do better, do better. Our conscience constantly accusing us. And your conscience is not a bad thing. In fact, it's a God thing. It's a good thing. He gave it to you. But even a good thing can become a bad thing when it becomes the thing that's driving you, is this drive, this do, this effort, I'm going to earn, right? There's a big difference in, in having a conversation about what you need to do and the conversation about what you need to do having you, where you're just completely locked up, frozen, paralyzed, overwhelmed with what needs to happen. We tell it to go away. Right? The thing inside of you that tells you to do or that you're not doing, we tell it to go away. We, we drink it away. We entertain it away. We ask Oprah to tell it to go away. And it doesn't. It just keeps persisting. It keeps driving. And here's the cycle, right? There's resolve. I'm going to do. And then there's failure. I didn't do it. And then there's remorse. And then there's guilt. And then there's frustration. And then there's resolve again. I'm going to do it. And then there's failure. And then there's remorse. And then there's guilt. And then there's frustration. And then doggone it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. And the dues keep coming. They keep multiplying. They keep demanding. They keep stealing until the good news breaks in. And the good news is that it's done. It's done. And you have to take that cry. It's finished. That cry that came from Calvary. And you have to apply it to your conscience that is constantly accusing you. Lately I've just been going to bed. Because when I go to bed there's this thing swarming. It's finished. It's finished. It's finished. And I just keep applying it to my to-do list. And then I wake up in the morning with a to-do list. I know you do too. And I just apply it. It's finished. It's done. And of course I do things in my day. I've been asked by God to do things in my day. But I do them from the place of recognizing what Christ has done. And there's a difference in that. There's fruit that comes from that. The other reason it's really difficult uh, to believe in the gospel of done is that sometimes the gospel of done is not what our churches preach. We have pretty demanding churches, and I'm allowed to say this because I'm the one usually making the demands. 
that Christianity really quickly becomes a set of do's and don'ts, that we major on the do's and don'ts. If you look at most of the preaching going on, it emphasizes what we can do as Christian parents, what we can do in Christian marriage, what we should do in Christian sex, what we should do with Christian money, what we should do as Christians in conflict. But it's all about what we can do. And it's easy for us to hear the preachers do over what Christ has done. Our ears are tuned to hear what we can do. Even at this point, some of you are like, when is this sermon going to be about what I can do? When, when are you going to talk about what we need to do? I've heard enough. Christ did this. He's done. He's done it. What do I do? Give me a list. Somebody give me a list. Am I supposed to take notes? What am I supposed to do? There's just this craving in us to do something, right? We had a close family in our church lose their daughter. And when the church heard about it, It was just constant calls. What can we do? What can we do? Can we give? Can we serve? Can we help? When's the memorial? Where's the family at? What can we do? When we hear about our salvation, it's like, it's amazing. All right, I'm going to roll my sleeves up. What can I do? What can I do? So we come to church, and it can feel like duty, 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 not done, 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 right? And I mean, I do this to you. I, I, I understand it. It's like you come and it's like Christ has done it. And I'd like to preach on Christian parenting. What's Christian parenting? Well, it's parenting, but it's, it's harder. It's harder than parenting. It's Christian parenting. Well, what the heck is Christian parenting? Well, it's like this parenting, but there's things you got to do, like lead your family in devotions. What? I don't even do devotions. Well, you got to do devotions, you know? And there's things you don't do, like you don't watch your kid watch He-Man. Don't let them watch that. That's a don't do. But what you do need to do is raise them in the way he should go. Well, how am I supposed to know the way he should go? Well, you need to read your Bible. Dang it. Yeah, that's right. I need to read my Bible. And then there's Christian money. Well, what's Christian money? I've done money, but what's Christian money? Christian money is where you have to do what's on the dollar bill. It says in God we trust, and no one does that. But now you become a Christian, and you're like, I guess i got to do that. I guess i got to trust God with my money, and I guess I better give, and I need to do these things to straighten this out. There's Christian sex. It's like, well, I've done it, right? I've done sex outside of being a Christian, but now I'm a Christian, and now there's Christian sex, which has different do's and don'ts, and you need to do it with certain people, and you need to do it at a certain time, and you need to do it in a certain context, right? You do it in certain positions, you know, these are all the... The words that come forward. This is what you need to do. And you need to not do this. Don't do this. And it's like, whoa, okay. This is, this is different than what I'm used to. And then there's Christian vocation, which is like a job but harder. Because now you have to honor your boss who's not honorable. And now you have to submit to a guy who doesn't have a clue. And now you have to bless those who persecute you and love enemies. And it's like, dang it, man. I need to do that. I've not been doing it. Christian conflict, it's like conflict, like all the same conflict that you get in, but Christian conflict's different because there's other things you do and don't do. The, one of the things you do is humble yourself, good luck with that, and then another thing you do is apologize and you own your own stuff. What? I've never done that. Yeah, well, you need to do that. It's part of being a Christian and getting in conflict. And so every Sunday can feel like do, 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 Right? It's usually what we hear, and then it's fail, 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 and then it's down, down, down. It usually starts like this. The Sunday you hear that like Christ has done it, you're sitting like right about where my dad's at, fourth row. After a few weeks, you're like where Matt Ainley's at, like eighth row. After a few more weeks, because it's fail, 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 you're where Neva's at, pretty close to the door, and then after eight weeks, I don't see you again. Because it was do, 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 it was fail, 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 and it was down, down, down. Until Jesus breaks in again with the good news, which is done, done, done. And you're like, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Have you really performed on my behalf? Do I really have salvation because of the efforts of another? And can I really work from this place of security? This is the good news of the gospel. Listen, what he's done always needs to be heard over the preacher's do. If you walk away and what you got was like, well, I need to do these things. I did not do my job. Again, we're going to do, but we're going to do it from the place of done. You have to hear every week about what he's done. Because we're so prone to wander, 
towards our own efforts and what we can do. Another thing that makes it really difficult for us is that we're in a work for wages culture. Am I right? It's like work equals reward. You've been taught that from a really early age. I'm trying to teach my daughters that currently. Work equals reward. That do equals dollars. That we work and we're rewarded. And then the heart of the gospel is that Christ has worked and we get rewarded? Wait a second, someone else works and then we get paid? Wait a second, someone else does the heavy lifting and then we get not just the load off our back, but we get his inheritance? This is, is this even right? I mean, is it, seriously, is this even right? Should this even be foundational for a country? No, work equals reward. And then the gospel comes and it's like, this is hard to believe. It's really hard to believe. The other reason it's really difficult to believe is unbelief. Just straight up, it's hard to believe the gospel of it is finished, that it's done, that it's complete, because of unbelief. What's the toughest thing, like, in the Bible for you, for you to, like, get your head around? The thing that you would say, man, if I could get my head around this, I could probably be saved. If I could get around my, my head around this, I could probably buy in and I'd end up coming to your church. If I could just settle this issue, the issue of miracles. Maybe you're taking the Thomas Jefferson approach and just getting rid of those because those are hard to believe. Don't tell me about a Red Sea. Don't tell me about a virgin birth. Don't tell me about a resurrection. We all know that's not logical. That's not reasonable. And so it's hard for me to get my head around miracles. Maybe it's the ark. Um, I, don't, I don't know uh, what it is for you. Most people struggle with these things. But I'd actually say the thing that we struggle with most is ten letters from the book of Ephesians. Those letters, words, being not by works. We struggle with that. There's so much unbelief towards this idea of salvation being a gift. It's not by works. It's not by works. If you can get your head around that, you can get saved. A lot of us still have issues with the ark. We're still trying to figure that out. But we got over the biggest hurdle, which was not by works. Not by works. Let me read to you from Ephesians 2 what I think to be the thing that is hardest for us to believe and in the way of us becoming. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of His great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in our transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved, and God raised us up with Christ and seated us with Him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. I mean, talk, I mean that, that might be another tough thing to get your head around. That might be the toughest. I take this whole point back. In order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace, expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. We're not saved by our good works, but we are saved for good works. And this is difficult for us. Am I right? Most of us want salvation based on our own effort. I'll tell you why we want that, or why I want that. I want to be in control. I want to know, I do this, God does this. I want to be able to control and manipulate God. I want to be in the driver's seat. 
I want a God who is not a God so that I can be a God and tell him what to do. So I do this, you do this, right? And if I do good, I get good. If I do bad, I get bad. I want a formula because I want to be in control. And the gospel is about God who is the committed initiator of relationship and cannot be manipulated. Cannot be manipulated. He'll drive this thing forward. If you want the gospel of grace, if you want the doneness, it involves losing control of the formulas that you've created where I do this and this is what I get. We also want a salvation based on our own efforts, what we can do, what we don't do, because of pride, we want to boast in it. We want to say, this is what I did. You know, I just turned things around. It was dark, but I pulled myself up by my bootstraps and I made it happen, you know? And God wants to see me now because I've made changes. <laughs> and I'm back and I'm better than ever. <laughs> we want to boast. We really do. We want to say, this is what I did. This is what I didn't do. We want control and we want our pride. And the gospel invites us to be out of control and humble ourselves. We'd rather have a salvation based on works. It's easier to figure out. The other reason it's tough to believe, last one, swear it. A lot of good reasons not to believe the gospel. (laughs) Failure. Like failure. Like even after you believed the message that it's finished, you failed. And it's like, don't tell me it's finished because I'm right in the thick of it. Don't tell me it's done because I'm still dealing with it. That ain't right. I know that I get in the door through what Christ has done. But now it's about what I can do. I know that I get in. My entrance fee is His divine done. But now that I'm in, I need to stay in. And I need to work. And I need to put forth this effort in order to stay in. Listen to me. Listen, you get in through his done, you stay in through his done, and then you finish by his done. You never get beyond what he's done. It's not just an entrance fee for us. And we've got to preach this again and again because we forget this. We forget this. We need to hear this over and over again. If you want to join this church, we get together on Sundays and we come here every week. Why do we come every week? Because every week we forget. And then we tell each other, remember what Jesus has done? And it's like, yeah, dang it, that's nice. That feels, that feels much better than what I've done this week. I like this. I'm going to come back next week. If you want to come back, you can. We'd love to have you. We work to keep the spotlight on Jesus. Like, in a weird way, it helps us to perform when we continue to spotlight him continue to fix our eyes on him, the author, the starter, and the finisher of our faith. Now, believing the gospel of done produces two things, produces more than two things, but because we have places to be, deviled eggs to eat, I just want to talk about two things that are produced by believing the gospel of done. There should be fruit that comes from believing the gospel of done, peace, peace. And joy, they come from believing the gospel of done. And if you don't have peace and joy, I would question if you believe it's finished. I don't think you actually believe it's done. If you did, you'd have peace, you'd have joy. Let me explain. I, my wife went to Mexico, and uh, my phone was broken, and maybe hers didn't work in Mexico. So when I finally get to my computer... I have a text from an unknown number from saying, hey, babe, it's me. Can you text me? And I was like, this is a crappy text to get from Mexico, you know? Like, in my mind, I'm like, I don't know where they're at, you know? Maybe they've been kidnapped by a cartel. Maybe the car's broken down. I don't know what's going on. And when I texted back, I didn't even say, like, Hey, how's the time in Mexico going? It was like, are you okay? He's like, yeah, I'm fine. I just had this question. She texted the question. And when I saw that, I'm okay. There was just a great sense of peace. That's what good news does. When you get good news, there's this exhale, this sense of relief. Like, ah, ah. And it should be that way when you hear this. You came in here. You felt like, ah, it's in trouble. Things are breaking down. Hear me. 
It's finished. It's done. And there should be a sense as we believe in the finished, the divine done. There should be a sense of peace. We will face trouble, but we're promised a peace that goes beyond our understanding even. That it won't even be like, okay, I understand that Tiff is safe and therefore I have peace. That we're promised a peace that can transcend understanding. Peace is obviously, in Scripture, it's not just the absence of conflict, but it's the presence of wholeness. Isaiah prophesied, again, hundreds of years before Jesus, that he would be the Prince of Peace, the Prince of Wholeness. Prophesied that of the greatness of his government and peace, there would be no end. That the striving ceases in this kingdom. Jesus in his ministry in John 16 says, I've told you guys some things. And I've told you these things so that you may have peace. Like I want you. I didn't tell you these things because I want you to do things. I didn't tell you these things because I want to demand things of you. I told you these things so that you could have peace. A sense of like, huh, man, life. Jesus appeared to his disciples after his resurrection. And this is amazing to me. I, I read this in most of the Gospels. He's appearing to people. Remember, these disciples are hecka confused, completely disoriented. What the heck just happened? The king was not supposed to die a criminal's death. Now there's rumors that he's up from the grave. What the heck is going on? They're troubled, to say the least. And Jesus appears, first words out of his mouth, peace, peace to you, peace to you. Not, why'd you guys bail on me? Left me up on that cross. Hung me out to try. What's wrong with you guys? The peace. Peace I give to you. The gospel's good news and it produces great joy. It does produce joy. It satisfies and motivates our hearts. It energizes us. I know that some of you are thinking like, are you seriously not going to tell us what to do? Like, are we never going to get a to-do list here? You know? Like, Travis, if you keep preaching this stuff, you'll produce a congregation of turds, people who don't do anything. That's the farthest thing from the truth. A church that believes in a Savior that was seated will take this city and this valley. It will motivate and it will energize our hearts. If you think that believing in the divine done is going to breed apathy, you're dead wrong. If you think that you can touch this kind of grace and then sit down and keep on sinning, you're wrong. People who touch this are changed. When this gets cleared away, cleaned away, swept away, it changes you forever. And you begin to do, but you do it from this place of like, he's done it. He's done it. The best thing, the best analogy I have for this, for you to understand the joy that comes and how it motivates and energizes us, is everybody's been playing a game or been in a sporting event where you're losing, you're just getting crushed. Maybe you're playing soccer and you're down four to zero or nil. What do you say in soccer? Nil. Four nil, sorry, for the soccer snobs. <laughs> four nil. And you're like, why are we even playing anymore? This game is long. I'm hot. You're kicking the dirt. The team's lifeless. And how many of you have been a part of a game, been a part of a sporting event where someone then announces next goal wins? You're down four goals. And then someone says, next goal wins. What happens to that team? All of a sudden they're energized. They've been given a new lease on life. A blank slate. Hope gets renewed. And the tiredness that marked our performance goes away. And we're energized Renewed by the divine done. So how is it ours? Like what do we do? <laughs> There's got to be something, right? What do we do to get this done? How do we get our hands on this done? How is this divine done ours? This divine done is ours by faith. By faith we receive this finished work of Jesus Christ. And I want you to think about placing your faith like distributing your weight. Right now, you are by faith sitting on something that you think is going to hold you. 
And you're not even thinking about it because you're pretty confident that it will. And you're trusting in it, you're leaning on it, you've placed your faith in it. I'm going to ask you to take your weight and begin to lean, not on what you can do, not on what you've done, not on your effort, but that you would take your weight and you would place it on what Christ has done, what Christ is doing, and his effort, that you begin to transfer your weight. I was told last week, I've been on a scooter for four months, non-weight bearing, and they said, hey, good news, you can put weight on it. And that first step was funny. It's videoed. Because it felt so awkward to put weight on something that had not been bearing weight. And it's taking me time, actually, to get used to putting weight on this foot. And for some of you, it's going to be like that. It's like, I've never transferred weight onto this. I've put all my weight. I've leaned on this. I've banked on this. I've trusted in this, what I can do. And now you're asking me to lean on this. And it's like, you know, it's like my first step, you know, where everyone's cringing, like, God. Is it going to give way? Maybe. For some, for sure, because I know, I know um, how it goes, there's some of you who are like, you don't know what I've done, or you wouldn't be saying it can be done. And you don't know what I've done, and you wouldn't be saying if you did uh, that it can be fixed with faith. Don't tell me that this can be fixed with faith. And you're you're totally right. I have no idea what you've done. And if I knew, I'd probably be like, wow, that's that's bad. And you should probably not do that. Or I don't know what I would say to you. But Jesus does know what you've done. He does know. And he's not that troubled by it. Here's why I feel like I can confidently say that to you. That he's not phased by what you've done. He's sitting down. Like you can't even get a rise out of him. Unfazed. You think that you're the exception. And he's seen a million of you and saved a million of you. You think like, you have no idea what I've done. You're right. But the person who does know what you've done is still seated. He's still seated. And my invitation to you would be to stop making more of what you've done than what he's done. It's just not a bigger it's not a big deal as you think it is. Nothing that can't be overcome. When he announced from Calvary it is finished, he meant what he said when he rose from death he took its sting when he ascended into heaven all authority and power was his and now he sits at the right hand of the father and he sits there until his enemies become his footstool and I just love this I mean what kind of like icing on the cake is this Oh, I'm going to go. What's he doing? Oh, he sat down. And then what's he going to do next? Put his feet up? On what? Coffee table? No, his enemies. His his enemies are actually going to be the coffee table. It's like, whoa, that is victory. That is is a win. It's a win when someone puts their feet on their opponents. That's, That's it, man. That's it. I'm going to pray. Is that okay? I do, Jesus, ask that you'd save us from this really small view of you. I do ask that you'd save us from just really small thoughts about you, about what you can do. And I pray that you'd save us from all these big thoughts about what we've done, about who we are and what we can pull off and how we don't even need to be saved because we got it together. Save us from that. I also want to ask that you'd save us from a view of you that's dictated by our circumstances. Well, I'm going through this, so God must look like this. Well, I'm facing this, so he must be even skinnier than I thought. Save us from that. Jesus, I want to thank you that you knew what we needed before we even knew what we needed. And even now, 
you know what's needed. I thank you for saving us. When we didn't care about you, didn't even think about you, thank you for pursuing us. And thank you for this plan of yours we submit uh, to your kingdom, to your rule and your reign. We ask that it would continue to extend, expand uh, through us, through this church. Amen. Hey, there are some people transferring their weight today. And this is fun for us. They're going to be baptized. They're essentially identifying with Jesus, saying, I'm with him. And uh, they're taking their weight off their own efforts, off their own doing, and putting it on what Christ has done. And so one of the things that we do as uh, a family is we just, we cheer our brains out when people get baptized. If you've never screamed in church, I'd like to invite you to do it. It's liberating. It feels good. Once you get past like the, the initial fear of it, it feels good. So we're going to watch a video. And then there's a few people that are going to be baptized this morning and we'll end our time by worshiping. Thanks for listening. We want to be a resource for you as you walk with Jesus. So please connect with us at radiantvicelia.com. Until next time.